Do not adjust your dial. This is not the podcast you are used to. This is a Big Brother Canada 12 recap on Rob Has a Podcast, not hosted by Taryn Armstrong, but perhaps someone a bit goofier. Hello, everybody. Mike Bloom here. Taryn's gone. And it's our house to play in now as we're ready to break down. The movie night massacre, the eviction quote unquote event of the week. We're going to break down whatever the hell we just watched. Now we can call it movie night massacre, but I prefer with this current panel to call it a movie Mike, Matt, Sir Kirsten, as we're going to break it all down tonight. It took me just as long to come up with that pun as it did Arissa to read out all the names that we already knew within the roles. We got to talk about whatever the hell was going on there. And I'm so excited for this panel to break it all down and figure out where we are going as we have just started sitting in our seats for whatever's about to play in front of us. Of course, our panel tonight, as I have uh, so punfully mentioned before, the great Kirsten McKinnis. Kirsten, how are you? Ah, don't do that. Oh, my God. So scary. Oh, was it just my face? Was that after I pulled off the mask? That should have been your reaction. It was, yeah, the, the mask, my CB. totally fine. The second the mask came off, oh, that got scary. Oh. Well, Matt Lagori, what do you think? Am I ugly? Is this how we're starting the podcast? Are you ugly? <laughs> Michael, <laughs> have more confidence in yourself. I, didn't, I did not say that. Am I more pleasant than getting bugs dumped on you while you try to hold a jar up? <laughs> Yes. I'm going to forego an introduction for myself and just let the uh, listeners know that may not be watching the YouTube video that Mike did start this podcast just now with a rolling type mask on his face in honor of the massacre. Um, I want everybody to know that we did not see that before we went live. So uh, <laughs> genuine shock came across the both of us. And uh, now we begin. And now we do begin. And oh, what boy. we begin to see is... It's. I wouldn't even call it Big Brother at a certain no, extent. Certainly not at all. I think we can start early and say that was not Big Brother. But some- what we what we got was some form of social strategy as we began the latest week of the game. Some are saying, okay, maybe we're starting jury this week. Jury is quite literally still out on that as everyone goes up to the HOH room for this unknown period of time. And when they come back down, not only is the house made over, but so is the structure of this round. Movie Night Massacre is here. And apparent two-episode event, oh, uh, maybe three, even. We're still not entirely sure. Whenever this podcast comes back, whenever someone's evicted, Taryn will be back interviewing them, also covering what's happening up to this point. We could also expect maybe Matt, I go to you as like my digital dailies expert, maybe no dailies until we get an eviction. Here. I think that's very safe to say. Uh, they did not give a daily on Friday so that we would not know what was happening before the massacre. If this all happened in one night, which it seems like it did, uh, that this was all one sequence of events. Everybody needed to stay, you know, continuity needed to occur. Uh, there's no chance that we're seeing anything until we evict. If we had to guess, and I'm sure we're going to speculate, I feel like the rest of the, the week is going to play out as normal with the veto, uh, you know, ceremony ending on, on Tuesday and then the eviction on Wednesday. So we're not going to see a, a second of what's going on behind the scenes. Uh, I don't think any dailies until Thursday. And even then, we're going to get much. Yeah. So, yeah. So- yeah, well, well, we'll get like seven dailies on Thursday so that we can find out. You know, what you probably are so right about that, which drives <laughs> me insane when they do that. I'm like, who's watching the first one, the second one, the third one? Who's even watching the fourth one? But, you know, some of us still do. Yeah, you know what? You want to do that Netflix model for digital dailies, it seems, whether it'll work in a binge format. But yeah, just setting some yeah. stuff up at the top here. Taryn is okay. He just has the night off. Uh, he will be back on Tuesday, we can confirm. Whether or not there will be an eviction, he will come back. He'll have a recap of whatever's going on in the house, which does look, for lack of a better term, pretty spicy, uh, considering mm-hmm. all the fallout that's going to happen. And he's going to have a lot to walk into as, again, the big headline of this episode is like, brand new social strategy game just kind of nestled inside of this episode of Big Brother Canada. I mean, I I think a lot of our expectations and thoughts ebbed and flow throughout the episode. I think a lot of this is going to be us right after the episode, kind of figuring out our thoughts on this new format overall. But Kirsten, what did you think about the past hour that we just witnessed? So it was 
somewhat compelling television for sure. I uh, it was not Big Brother. I don't I don't think it's a direction I like for Big Brother to make everything reliant on the order you perform in a competition. I think that's boring and not really the point. Uh, and I, I, I wish it had just been a longer episode and we had gotten the full cinematic experience. This is like when they're like, okay, this, we're going to start breaking the last in a series into two movies, you know? Yeah. No, just give me the whole movie. If, if there's one thing Big Brother Canada is going to do and that I don't think anybody has ever contested, it's the production value is always there. They always, you know, go all out with the uh, effects. And I mean, even starting from the beginning of the episode, they were doing a lot. Too much? That's up to you. Uh, the intro and and turning it into, you know, the uh, the scary purge-like, you know, announcement and the alarms that are going off to scare the crap out of you. And that part of it, you know, the, the show of it, I can appreciate. And I probably appreciated the rest of the episode um, maybe more than I, I would have expected to. I think the one very obvious downfall of this episode was the pacing. Because at mm -hmm. first we thought this was all going to be across one night that we were going to get the veto then play out and this was going to serve as like a full episode kind of double eviction type of deal and we were going to lose somebody that did not happen we saw uh we all probably theorized as we got closer to the end all right it's 8 50 for uh, east coast um that the episode is coming uh coming to an end we don't have time for a veto and an eviction yeah um, so I, watching... I, I, was, I was holding out hope because that first 10 minutes was done without an act break like it went through the aftermath of the eviction, mm -hmm. through some planning, through, oh my God, what's going on? Let's sit in these like sketchy recliners. And I thought, okay, maybe we'll do the same thing at the end. But listen, we didn't get any sponsorships in Big Brother Canada. So we had to get it around them that we were cutting like three times over the course of the last 15 minutes. That's where mm -hmm. I did lose all hope today. A la Coco Montrees. Was Are this whole there... thing sponsored? Was there, was there like a movie, scary movie sponsor? Because if they didn't, no, that's a. Wow. Yeah, there's no uh extra well, stuff too going on. Them, they usually... That's why they needed all the commercials, obviously. Huh. But did yeah. you so I, I want to ask because y'all, you know, you're American, you don't actually watch that much Canadian TV. Are there any Canadian commercials that you're finding particularly compelling this season of BB Can? They have a commercial that plays for all it's an ad that goes in every single Belly drop. Um, I don't even know what it's for because I skip it on the drops. Don't tell them uh, that uh, you wow. know I can have that power. Um, and it also plays in the episode. It's 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 uh, it starts with uh, I'm so excited. The song playing mm. uh, uh, along it. I, I, it's literally mm -hmm. playing in my head right and, now. And like somebody's like, so did they win auto or something like that? Um, I think that, so. It, yeah, it, it plays every time and every time on a drop that, you know, they have so many heads interspliced. I'm always hearing. I'm so excited. Um, I do, it's not I do my like, favorite. Uh, it's annoying. I do like Mr. Tony bet. I'm not sure what his name is, but like he seems like a fun guy. Oh, yeah. Adam's right. It's a winner's ad that I'm so excited. Okay. Oh. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Winners is on my list uh, for having that ad be so repetitive. Um, yeah, but Mike, it, it did feel like... Um, if if we had known going into this episode we were to expect that it wasn't going to end in an eviction, I think the pacing would have made more sense because that we're sitting there the whole time waiting to find yeah. out like who's going to go home. Again, if I knew that nobody was going to go home and this was just going to end where it ended, they squeezed the veto in like the last five minutes too. It's like if you're going to extend out to Tuesday or maybe even Wednesday, I don't know, like breathe a little bit. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I agree on the one hand, like when we saw – Every single person process to the back and read the same card. And even having, you know, Elijah and Avery, who basically couldn't pick roles, still going back there and going through the same thing. And then when we had Arissa come back and then do the slow dramatic reveal, I thought, okay, this is way too much chaff. After I thought we were getting some interesting momentum going, I think really the crux of our talk tonight is going to be through yeah. a lot of, okay, what's the ideal choice when you are in each position picking each role of this new game but if i'm to believe the next time on teaser that's happening like i don't want a lot of this drama to be like crammed into like a five minute mm -hmm. segment in the episode right if there is indeed a lot of shit hitting the fan like let's dedicate an entire episode to that i think the ideal would have been like we have done a couple times at big brother us let's make this a big two-hour episode Let's put mm -hmm. Sunday and Tuesday together and then make it around. Because I also think something that, again, is, is a bit confusing is that we have to 
we have to get rid of a good amount of people, right? Between here and now, we're at nine, but we have to be at three in like four weeks. And we yeah. started with less people than usual, too. We started with 14, well, not 16. And so, wait, Kate, so we're how, how many are we at now? Nine now, or we're about we have, to be at nine? We're at nine right now. We nine got rid of now. five. Okay, and that's really interesting because typically at this point would be the triple eviction because they like to or no do they do that at seven well, they would have definitely done a double by now and then the triple maybe in like a week or two yeah I interesting i th i do think like from a tv perspective a few things that would have made this better is one if they don't show everybody reading the same card over and over again like i'm fine with the jump scare for everyone that's funny like keep it in so they could but they could have made up time by not having everyone reading the card and i think it would have been better if they couldn't see who had already been cast into what roles, they just oh, had okay. which roles were available and which people were available. So like, you know, when Avery goes in to make her choice, like she doesn't know she's nominated kind of vibes. Yeah. I, I go back and forth about that. Cause I do agree on the one hand, like, yeah, it's nice to have everyone kind of do it blindly of, Oh, here are the roles for you. Pick what you can. But I do love moments where Anthony comes in for instance, and is like, trying to work backwards what he thinks just happened in the previous 10 mm -hmm. minutes of like oh well i think bailey picked this and then todd must have picked this and then maybe tola picked this and i think again that's going to lead to a lot of like yeah fun whisperings and assumptions that's really going to bubble to the forefront in this episode i mean really the headline out of this wild twist is perhaps the decimation of the hot chocolate alliance yeah uh because they come in we start this episode and we'll like briefly touch upon any sort of pre-movie night madness shenanigans because i guess it does set up maybe a bit uh in terms of tnt's big move and whether or not that came to fruition but you know hot chocolate had been this alliance that had pretty much been running the season up to this point and was certainly building to an interesting tension point where anthony's closest ally ends up going really at the hands of the rest of the alliance and it was starting to size up to become something pretty interesting and then lo and behold big brother ends up throwing a twist in to perhaps uh curtail those plans but now despite the fact that kayla just won pov and there's a chance that victoria will probably not nominate someone unless she decides to spicy v it and put up maybe someone like anthony uh there is still a chance that this powerful alliance at least has touched the block which matt i think is a pretty big deal considering the iron grip they had over the season so far it is. I mean, coming out of last week, Matt goes home. It seems like from where I'm sitting that Kayla, Brie, and Spicy are in the best top three positions in the game. Um, maybe not exactly at the top because you still have like the Baileys um, and Todd, but like Bailey specifically, who like now comes out totally in the middle of the groups that may be warring with each other. And now no one's looking at Bailey. Taryn, Taryn said that caster two, you know, in the time this all started going down. Um, but now you have this world where the episode at the beginning, I thought, did a very good job in setting up the fact that Todd is now we're down we're down in numbers. Todd, who's somebody nobody was considering throughout most of the season so far, and you know, fair enough. Uh, but at this point, Todd has been placed alongside with that group of uh, Kayla, Spicy, and uh, and and Avery, where you know, hot chocolate has still existed, but like they kind of split off, and they were like, oh, we're on this side, you're on this side, but we always come together. It's about hot chocolate. So then, you know, the uh, the Kayla and Spicy side, they have Bailey and Todd, but maybe they don't have Todd anymore. And then the way that this episode plays out, where they certainly don't seem to have Todd as ironclad as they thought they did, because Todd puts one of the uh, puts uh, another one of them up to ensure that it's two of those people on the, on his supposed side going up. Um, now you have a world where the vote essentially be controlled by anthony tola todd and lexus we'll see what happens with all these conversations if you know that group with spicy can pull back in a lexus or a todd but if anthony is able to get his claws on them and say we need to make sure that one of spicy's numbers go then avery's out of here there's a lot yeah about how yeah down. well and i think it just goes to show like we get information from digital dailies but it's just not the same because we don't have the full context of these dynamics and we can only have the context that the show is choosing to give to us right which is a huge downside to actually analyzing what's happening it i hate I, like i hate to just constantly be, like be complaining about no live feeds but it just, it's just like it it makes it harder for us to do our job because we don't know all of the moving pieces the way that we would otherwise um but i do think like 
through last week's episodes, V talks a lot about, well, you know, like we have to pick off of each other's sides and your side needs to just win. Like, sorry, we're not going to keep it fair. Your side needs to win. And that is just not going to give, you know, goodwill to the others. So then they will put in the work to pick up new numbers. Yeah, so the, well, the last thing we see before the massacre begins is TNT about to blow up the house here. And it's really interesting to pair this with, as I watched the Matt eviction episode last night to catch up, and the conversation that Todd and Elijah have processing around the backyard where it's like basically the same conversation, right? It's like, yeah, you realize that we're kind of under the thumb of these three women. Okay, yeah, we're going to have to take a shot at them sooner rather than later. This was obviously much more explicit in that Todd really seems to follow the, the Rob Sesternino you know, adage, right? And starts waking up halfway through the game and deciding Kayla is the one to go after. And I thought, again, under the assumption that this was going to be one self-contained round in an episode, I thought she was gone. So tell mm -hmm. me the, the, the umpteen surprise of many at the end of this episode when she ends up winning the veto. But Kristen, from your perspective, is Kayla the right target if you're a Todd and a Tola here? I mean, I don't think so, because I think that Todd and Tola just don't, they don't have enough control. Like, I think all the people that they're relying on have other people that they're more loyal to. Like, I just don't know. I don't even know if there is a right target for Todd and Tola at this point with how the numbers have diminished. I don't know. I would yeah, say, I would think, say it's not, not, not the worst, uh, not, not the <laughs> Correct target. Um, I think it, you know, when you're, when you're looking at the three women as who they would potentially be going after, you have obviously Kayla, Spicy, Avery. Uh, Spicy, you know, a lot of people have had a lot of thoughts about Spicy and her gameplay throughout the season. One, I can't, I didn't know she has gotten herself in such a good spot socially with so many people. She still remains to me at the top of the house as far as mm -hmm. on a social level. I think if she sat on the block next to anybody last week, this week, next week, I think she's got the votes because people feel like she's done a good enough job connecting with everybody to the point where even though she has no, by no means has like Tola's best interests in mind, um, she's had enough conversations with him where Tola would believe that spicy could be on his side quicker than Kayla would be. Um, so, and Avery, I think as well, has done a good job connecting with a handful of people. She didn't want to send Matt home last week. Just came up from allies and, you know, she herself realized that it was a, made a lot of sense for her alliance. Uh, but I think that Kayla is the one of the three that has the least genuine, authentic conversations with some of those guys like Tola and Todd, where they really go through, like they go through Bailey to, to talk about, uh, to, um, to, uh, they don't, to at all so i mean tola could you know just throw whatever at the wall pick any of the three of them and he'd be fine but i think kayla stands out uh as as why uh you know one that they could all agree on and it's kind of like the matt now on the spicy side uh, of where matt was last week of just like this is an extra person who doesn't really fit into our end game yeah i think from specifically from the todd perspective because i'm a little more honed in on that than the Tola perspective. Mm -hmm. Again, it's a little bit of a game of inches, well, but there's not much of a Tola perspective told <laughs> throughout the season. I, we we really enough. don't <laughs> see a lot of Tola just but in if, general. But if I'm yeah. Todd, I'm, I'm sort of trying to do what the three women had been doing this entire time, which is like trying to strategically take shots. It's like playing a game of Jenga where it's like, if I'm going to remove a piece, let me try to take out a piece that still has my structure remaining relatively stable and i think for todd he wants to still make sure he's connected to bailey like that seems to be a relationship that i think he still wants to invest in i'd heard a little bit of scuttlebutt around matt's eviction about how maybe todd and bailey were looking to swap over to like the whole anthony tola side that they were maybe starting to eyeball those three girls as well and so i think you know a uh, bailey's gonna l lay this out as she's going to cast this her first role here right of like well i don't trust a lot of people but the only people i trust are avery victoria and Todd, I think if Todd has that knowledge of that literal hit list, then he goes, okay, who's someone on that opposite side that I can take out who also won't piss off my number one ally? And Kayla happens to be in the middle of that Venn diagram. So I think it's a mm -hmm. good shot to take. It's ultimately going to miss. And I think that's what they're kind of forecasting next time is like, oh shit, the two of us basically put Kayla up on the block. Now it's going to bounce back on us. But I, I think it made sense in the moment. But of course that moment passes as everyone goes to sleep, they're woken up by a blaring red alert and are told to immediately evacuate to the HOH room. And 
Big Brother Canada does not half-ass anything. Either mm. it no asses or it full asses. It's not like it's yeah. it's gonna do all or nothing, basically. And here we just get like one of the biggest aesthetic twists I have ever seen in the show's history. And mm -hmm. it's understandable as it sets up what seems to be this night, or from our perspective, nights from hell. Well, and I love I love making them pack their shit. That's so funny. Like, yeah, you're be scared. Pack it up. You don't know who's going home. I loved it. I just can't even imagine. I mean, you you hear them all start to scream. Adrenaline is pumping through veins like yeah. nobody's business. Um, I can't imagine being in the house. Like, it's, it's you know, one thing to just be watching it. But to be living mm -hmm. through that, like Tola, who has been the quietest dude, you know, most mellow dude, is like in the backyard screaming, ah! Like, what are just you so waiting for? Well, the thing is, like, you're locked in that house. You would th that alarm goes off, you're gonna think, Oh my god, is like there a fire? Is like, is another, the big is brother another, house burning like, down right now? Do you think they thought it was another BB can eight situation? They're I was like, thinking, Oh no, that. I was like, do you think they're, now? They, they're getting evacuated in a much more extreme measure this time? Like, what's going on out there? Oh, I um, should hope that they're smarter than well. That. Yeah, I, I mean, if you remember, a, not to like talk no. too much about Big Brother US, but there was one time I remember very specifically where they broadcast a bunch of headlines and one of them made reference to the cbs series jericho that was about like a virus but nobody knew because a nobody watched jericho let alone people that were cooped up inside a cbs radford lot for months at a time and so it's just like you're trying to play a game and then this random thing comes across like oh yes this new norovirus has emerged in jakarta and you're like well how am i supposed to do anything about that now yeah and famously um, no one has watched jericho to this day <laughs> nope um, they, uh, people I, sent in peanuts one time. <laughs> I I think they, you know, again, nobody's disputing the fact that production did their job on uh, putting this whole thing together, the effects, just creating the desired, uh, you know, emotion in all of these house guests. Where by the time they get to the backyard for this first competition, they're all already, you know, there's they're expect we'll get into the competition where they're, you know, holding these yeah. chains up and they're all shaking the entire time as they're getting set up because everything is scaring the crap out of them as they go throughout the entire rest of the competition and the jump scares that come. They really made it to be this movie, you know, of 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 just absolute horror uh and again their job with that part though i i will say uh there's been a lot to quibble a little bit of samantha semantics coming out with people uh quibbling a bit with the term of the movie night massacre i think some people assume that massacre assumes multiple victims mm -hmm. uh and, I, I would and agree based on the grammar yeah, although I mean, I think like emotional victims, there will certainly be a lot of people that will be left scarred by the end of this, you know, like they'll escape with their lives, but at what cost? <laughs> they'll yeah. all have to talk to Dr. Stein after this one. <laughs> exactly. Well, let the mayhem begin. Everyone sits in their like, oh, so neat uh, recliner chairs was mm -hmm. just like, makes me feel from a sanitary perspective. I don't know if I'm ever going to go to those recliner seat theaters again, just because I can't think about all the work that went into getting those out there as Arissa is basically going to introduce them to their first competition, which is like a, an endurance competition combined with sort of our typical stay in there for a hundred minutes challenge where infamously the, the most famous example I can remember from BB can was big brother Canada five, of course, when Ika freaks yes. out over the bunny rabbit hopping mm -hmm. all over her. Now I'll admit, I was ready to, you know, uh, put on my conspiracy tinfoil hat for a second and be like, okay, so they're holding up a jar with their arms for as long as possible. All right, which guy is going to take this? But mm -hmm. no, Bailey continues to be the surprise of the season between personality, between strategy, and between competition prowess. Yeah. The minute I saw those boxes, I was like, oh, they're going to dump bugs on them. There's if I was in the I wouldn't put my head in the box. I'd be like, I don't need power tonight. Yeah. Bye. I like send me home. No. I'd rather be literally dead than have a worm dropped on me. Mm -hmm. No. Um I want to give them, well, I want to give them, yeah, the benefit of the doubt, at least, and say that, do we all assume that they must have had uh, those jars of whatever, like, proportioned based on, like, body weight or whatever? Like, they were, Anthony I... wasn't holding the same as Avery, right? I have to. Hope. I don't know <laughs> that I trust I mean, them to do that. I I wonder if maybe just it being chains instead of directly holding it ha made some sort of difference where the weight wasn't as important. But like, I highly doubt they measured all that stuff 
by yeah, I mean, it, it could have just been like a technique perspective, right? Like if you're not immediately tensing up your arms from the first minute, then that could certainly help in terms of longevity. But again, I'll give some give massive kudos to Bailey, who was able to be also one of the most unfazed by all the literal shit that was thrown mm -hmm. on them. So we had what fake blood, yeah. fake teeth. They just ran, also they just ran, you know like, threw a platter of raw fish in there. <laughs> Anyone who's been keeping an eye on the dailies enough to see like the Bailey and Anthony conversations that have gone on throughout the season should have known that Bailey would have a good chance in this because she's not afraid to go toe to toe with one of the most stubborn people in the house, uh, Anthony Douglas, and she will have conversations with him. She will get into it with him. So the fact that Bailey was, you know, I guess stubborn enough to stick it out through a competition like this, where nothing was going to scare her away, make her arm shake, make her make anything, you know, it, it all just made a lot of sense by the end of it. I was very I mean, happy to see her be the one to take it home. Yeah, I could see Bailey, like she's kind of flirting with Anthony these days. So you're be flirting with Anthony and the big brother house. You got to be patient. I, I do feel bad for Kayla in multiple ways over the course of this episode, but it did seem like she, it was a little cheapo depot that like she drops immediately because the blood gets dumped on her Nickelodeon slime style. And like, you can't prepare for that, right? Like you kind of have to get a little lucky that, okay, I'm not shaky enough that when I'm hit with something that I would not have expected whatsoever, everyone else can expect at least like, now I have to anticipate something falling from the ceiling. They had no idea what was coming to them that first time. And she just, I think out of pure shock, kind of jostles her arm and it drops and as a result we get this whole waterfall where who knows if she somehow lasted longer in the competition if she beats out todd and tola as an example then she doesn't end up on that block maybe yeah well really wait, tough so she... luck but like you gotta expect something's gonna drop on you yeah i mean even if she lasted one or two more people past where she did then she still ends up on the block Right, because yeah. Todd or Tola yeah. being at the end of the thing where they were, or we're still going to put her up. And it's it was funny, uh, Mike, as you alluded to earlier, of like the who were at the end, the and uh, whoever went before Goose, uh, I'm forgetting, uh, didn't have any choices left because there was only two spots of uh, POV player left. So they went in there, and uh, Avery, I think she's looking at it. She's yeah. like, "So I have two names here, and there's two spots left." And they really, I mean, not to completely cut ahead, but they really did seem like that was a decision to be made, which was wild. Move along, yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's like going to the voting booth and like there's only one person running for the school board, right? Like there's no write in candidates for this, even though Victoria did try to like ask for like, excuse me, I am a returning player production. Can I jostle these up really quick? Is yeah. there a coup d'etat around here? She's like, I am the head of household. So can True. I make a change? Doesn't yeah. hurt to ask. Well, and this too, like, so V's not going to be able to play in the next HOH and very likely could be losing Avery. Tough. Tough blow for V here. We'll see. Listen, if Jag was able to be the invisible HOH and play Don't again. Don't say that name. Uh, anything <laughs> is possible in the world of Big Brother. Games. And speaking of which, so let's get to the reason why we're talking here. Let's talk about, we, we got through this competition. We have our order and we're wondering what the hell is going on. We're picking a number. We're standing in line, in line for what? And it turns out that our Big Brother players have taken a page out of Robin Cass's book and have become casting directors in and of themselves. So they walk so they walk into the backyard and they see the jankiest squid game knockoffs I've ever seen where I'm pretty sure they just took glow in the dark spike tape and just put them across like Jabberwocky's masks they got from the the Halloween store but I love it. But they are given a set of roles. There is safe which is automatically slotted into Bailey, HOH, slot pass, two nominees, three POV players, and a no eviction vote slot. So safe, but cannot vote. And so basically, this is a little safety chain adjacent, I would say. It's like safety chain's kind of a weird cousin from the other part of the country, and that we're going in a bit of a detour from the way Big Brother is usually done. But there is some similar DNA, I would say. You know, there still was a veto competition. There was still going to be an eviction vote. We are still emerging from this week with an HOH, with nominees, etc. But the way we get there is completely unconventional. So let's put the structural issues aside. Matt, as like a social strategy competition, what did you think about this? And how much did it take you out of the rest of what Big Brother is supposed to be? I would say not that much. It didn't, it didn't take me that much 
out of normal either because we still were looking at board of these big brother roles. It was just a very non-traditional way of how we were filling the roles. And I, I really didn't hate it. I really didn't hate the concept of the game, at least trying it once because between this discussion that we're going to have right now, seeing everybody's opinions who are watching, uh, I want to hear has to say about this i want to uh, all like discuss like it was this fun it was this something that we should do again because again by my initial uh thought as i'm watching it's I'm like this is very intriguing i don't think we've seen something like this before if we have i'm forgetting about it um and just to see like the the, the casting aspect of it of like you know immediately really has to decide who she should, you know she she has the whole board of players do you fill the hoh spot or do you fill a nominee spot and my brain is racing watching her do that of saying like i think she has to put a nominee up and then i'm like but wait if she doesn't do that, then, you know, Toll is next and Toll is going to put himself as HOH. And then if somebody comes, there's a million thoughts through your brain of what they move and we're probably going to talk about, you know, what they should have or shouldn't have done. But um, just the possibilities, I think, were keeping me invested enough that I was like, even if this isn't, in, you know, exactly what we've known Big Brother to be, it's like, it, to me, like, and Mike, and maybe, you know, you can speak on my thought process about this comparison, but um, Australian Survivor will do just the most wild twist on any given week and we're like well this isn't survivor but it's australian survivor so like mm. maybe this isn't big brother but it's big brother canada yeah kirsten what about you i know you have spoken about before about how what we watched wasn't big brother but did you yeah. enjoy it i didn't not enjoy it i i feel like i'm kind of in the middle uh, as to like the i think if we had gotten all of it in one shot i would enjoy it a lot more you, like mm. does that make sense like though just yeah the fact that, that, that it, it felt got... like sort of like a, a one-time kind of aberration right yes. like, okay we took care of this now we can get back to our regularly scheduled mm -hmm. program for lack of a better yes term. exactly like i think if we had just gotten to see who went home then it's like okay we got through it all and it was fun but the fact that we didn't get to see an actual conclusion just left it feeling really unsatisfying for me personally um i think it's tough i it's unfortunate that when we see bailey win finally it's in just safety and she doesn't actually have you know that hoh power because i would love to see how she wields that oh man yes like i i really i really want to see bailey as as an hoh but I think she, I think she needed to put, like, nominate someone. Yeah. So let's, it, yeah, let let's talk about that. Um, before we do, I I will say that I, I really enjoy this. I think for me, it's not that I thought we were sort of like belaying a rote outcome. And who knows? Maybe if Bailey had won HOH, we would have gotten you know, uh, Tola and Elijah nominations, and then like, okay, we just sort of play it out and move on with things. But I, I just. I'm still wrapping my head around all the configurations that this can bring up because there's this idea of, okay, what role do I put people into based on not just where they are now, but like what could happen later? You know, let me, who do I put as HOH knowing that they could possibly nominate somebody? Who do I put as a POV player versus having them, giving them a slot pass or putting, giving them no eviction vote, basically sitting them out of the power of veto competition. And then on top of that, as you talked about, there's this additional element of, well, there are people going after me. So since it's sort of like first come, first serve, do I purposely take a certain name off the board so they can't be utilized by other people? I think there's a lot of really delicious complications that are involved yeah. in this to the point where I kind of want it to be like another show in and of itself. Like I, I kind of want this to be, there was a a game, an online game a while back, I think called like Totem Pole that would sort of do uh, a schoolyard pick style every single round. And then like whoever was on the bottom, the last pick would end up getting eliminated. And I kind of like that as just a style of elimination each and every time. I don't know if we need like a Big Brother-esque format to it, but it was throwing like a little bit of House of Villains in there as well because they have a Big Brother-esque format. I think there's so much new stuff there and the new stuff wasn't to me so either confusing or ridiculous or detrimental to the game that it had me throwing up my hands in anger. So like with the low bar that big brother twists usually are, it freaking cleared it like a thoroughbred. And I yeah. had a great time doing this again, perfect world to Kirsten's point. I wish it would see through to completion, but if this means that we get more interpersonal drama from what's about to unfold as we're about to get into, then I'm all for it. 
And, and I think we could also maybe tweak some of the uh, casting spots uh, like slot pass does nothing for us tonight, you know, to make us excited about who, you know, who got the slot pass. Um, but I, and, and I don't know specifically what other roles they could have cast, but I think other things that have to do with the game and spots that could really affect something like if somebody could get a double vote, like somebody gets two uh, votes in this eviction mm -hmm. or something like that, just cast other things that are, are more worthwhile pass like, you know, give you more intrigue. Because by the time that we got the HOH, the two nominees, and I would say even with Anthony's, like, who doesn't get to vote that he places Goose on, um, I think after that, it's like, okay, we're not doing anything else exciting all the way down to the end. So um, you could probably even maybe uh, replace the POV spots. I, I think that they could continue to think on this and make it, like, perfect. I think even making, instead of a slop pass, make someone a have not for an extended period of time mm. because i think there's a lot more drama that will come out of someone now has to be a have not because of someone else versus like how much gratitude is anthony gonna feel towards anybody for getting a slot pass? like he's not like that's just not that much it's like oh thank you and then they move on with their life and they're not miserable oh you're, you're making someone a have not for the rest of the season for the next month that's drama they're gonna be mad like if you're gonna have have nots make it dramatic or just incorporate what we adore about the prizes and punishments competition in big brother right like you can make some extra thoughts for like paris vacation or uh dress yeah, a up a wing vacation yeah, dress, a wendy's breakfast dress up or dress up like a mealworm for the rest of the week i feel like big brother yeah. canada doesn't <laughs> do a lot of like those individual punishments that are usually just like rife throughout yeah, big brother tasks. u.s yeah. yeah, but it could be interesting as well because we always see so much drama out of that Yankee swap competition of like, so-and-so took this vacation away from me or I can't believe this person. A freaking unitod! I can't believe this! Like, I, I think it could be interesting, especially with a cast that can be occasionally as petty as this, to see someone individually do it but under the guise of an anonymity could be like a very fun mm -hmm. middle ground to strike yeah and then like in bb can five when they did the have not cookie thing then they show the footage to everybody mm -hmm. afterwards so that you know exactly who did it all right well let's start getting into these picks as we start with bailey and so bailey's gonna go back and forth again she gives us our own short list saying like okay the people that i do trust is i want to make sure that avery victoria and todd are safe well uh two out of three ain't bad as we're about to get into perhaps prognosticating in what's to come and so she is ultimately going to choose victoria as the hoh which as a reminder obviously the hoh did not set their own out nominees even though it would not be totally unbecoming of victoria to nominate a woman these were not her nominees uh and but because kayla won the veto and will assumingly be losing using it on herself she still does have the opportunity to re nominate so we will have in tuesday's episode hopefully victoria at least victoria's re-nomination so i've seen a lot of back and forth in the scuttlebutt of uh you know big brother canada twitter as sort of like small as it is about whether or not this was the right decision for her to make especially considering what befell avery and kayla thereafter kirsten where do you stand i think it would have been more interesting for her to make a nomination, but it is, it's also tricky knowing that Tola is going to be the next one coming in. Maybe you don't want Tola deciding who the HOH is more than you want, than you don't want him deciding a nominee. I don't know. So you end up in a world where if, Bailey decided, like, just to play it out. And it's also so interesting, of course, the fact that they know who's going in next after them. Like, suppose there was somehow that this worked where they didn't know who was next and Bailey just has to, you know, blindly decide what role, but, like, not knowing that Tola's the next one to come in. Again, there's so many layers of this that if they tweaked it in this or that direction that it could just be even crazier. But um, knowing the information that she knows, suppose she puts up a nominee and I think, I don't know, Tola's probably the number one person that she would say, you know, this person's not great for my game. Let me put him on the board. Um, she, well, so Tola can't put himself, uh, as the HOH when he goes in there next, right. but the next and the closest person to him, if he feels good with Todd, let's say he decides that he's going to put Todd on the board there. Um, then. Oh, no, I think he definitely put Anthony up there. If, or at least that's probably what she's assuming, right? Probably. I mean. Because for how many weeks were they talking about, oh, we have to take Tola out because it weakens Anthony. Like, isn't that the perception yeah. of him at this point? The the perception but i would say it's still just like i don't know how much like gravity that conversation had with todd and tola of like how good they felt with each other coming out of that of like anthony still does seem like he's working with spicy to an extent even though she's 
that. Um, so I don't know, but either way, so if if Anthony or Todd ends up in that HOH seat, uh, it's probably not going to be a good renom for what Bailey wants. So suppose you Bailey puts Tola on the block, then Todd is going to then come in after Tola, and who's Todd going to put up? Like having that power of HOH in Anthony or Todd's hands, whoever it is, that. Bailey will not have like Bailey would have some control if it was Todd, but if it's Anthony, she doesn't have control. And then so I get where she's coming from by saying, let me put yeah. in like the next most powerful position, somebody that I trust, because if we have the worst case scenario play out, which she did of the two nominees end up being two people that she's working very closely with, there's a chance that one of them comes down and the next most powerful person, the only person left that is going to have power to put somebody on the nomination block in this game should be somebody that I trust. So I get it, but I, I still, I still could see it going other ways. Now, do you think Matt, what if she had picked either Kayla or Avery as HOH instead of V? Oh, so I, I feel know, like so V I is also much allowed. more like insulated. Well, we should point this out. Actually, Avery was not allowed to be HOH. It was part of the card oh, that, right, she was yes. not, that she was not allowed to nominate the outgoing HOH as HOH again. And, and, so and Bailey Kayla. said, they specifically said, right, that she wanted Spicy, Avery, or Todd safe. She didn't even mention yep. Kayla, yeah, which makes true. sense because Avery kept her safe this week, feeling good with the women, but like specifically Spicy. Spicy is like her number two, uh, aside from Todd. You know, you can go back and forth of which one Bailey would be more loyal to at this point. Bailey has, uh, not Bailey, uh, Victoria has done a good job keeping Bailey so close and like saving Bailey from like the brink of death after Donna went home and uh, Bailey was brought into that side. So if she doesn't go V, I, I mean, she she would have gone Todd as, yeah. as so, making it. Yeah, true. Yeah, so it's tough. Like, I do think on paper, if you are the first to go, I feel like the majority of the time your decision should be, like, lock in one of the two nominees. Like, yes, there's a chance they could come off, but, like, that is you sort of serving as an HOH in your own way, even though you will not be HOH. But again, what makes this game so much fun is thinking about the decisions thereafter, where if I'm Bailey and I knock in one of the nominees i would imagine that like okay todd probably i mean tola probably either locks in a girl as either a nominee or very crucially no eviction vote because let's also look at this situation right the house as we saw it was cleanly divided in two it takes four votes to evict and i think another reason why avery's a little bit up a creek right now is because victoria can't vote and goose can't vote and so four is the magic number. That's all you need. And so if you have like a Todd Tola one-two punch of putting a girl as a nominee and a no eviction vote, or hell, if Todd decides to stick loyal to Bailey and like does something else entirely, and then Lexus comes in, who has become very recently scorned by the women and decides to give a girl either a nominee or a no eviction vote, that's it game over you have to hope for a veto and a hail mary like an anthony backdoor as we're about to get into so ironically enough it did feel like the safer thing to do even though it did end up resulting in two of her allies going up on the block yeah. even as we're talking through all of this it's like you're you're trying to out like look what is she going to have decided after all this is said and done? Um, and the fact that, you know, where these roles ended up of Elijah being the one that can't vote um, and uh, like the four votes would then would then become three. Goose is not on the block, right? The, there would be mm -hmm. one less vote. The votes are the same and well, he doesn't have a vote anyway. But if somebody that does have a vote ends up on the block, am I doing the math wrong? Like, does that then become three votes right, plus uh, victoria then carry the day right so then it would be it's six people voting but if goose is part of those six and doesn't vote then it's five so all it's you five. need is three votes and then oh yeah. my god <laughs> well okay and then i now that we're really talking through it so bailey stayed in that disgusting box holding up the jar of blood for so long and she just gets to pick first is that even and that much power, really? Yes, only in the sense that, well, okay, being very results oriented, if she had not, like, if she was out in the top, you know, couple of picks before uh, is out, Tola's putting her up as a nominee. So, yeah, but well, like, it ended up working out for her, but uh, that's very results oriented. Like, it's fine. Like, she's fine. But I don't know that this is a power equivalent to winning a competition to like that, where typically yeah, you would totally fair. be a head of households, right? So, like, I'm trying to think how could they change things, and I think it would be almost 
more interesting if it was like, okay, the first person, the the last person out can set up the whole board. And then the next person could go in and like make however many swaps. And then at the end, Bailey gets to go in and like make three swaps or something. Then that gives her power way more than just making one pick at the start. I, I guess it's this idea, right, of it's a massacre, asterisk. No one is safe that they feel like becoming the only guaranteed person safe is like the ultimate moniker even though again they're about to make another person safe immediately mm -hmm. in her choice in victoria i mean i i think honestly sort of do what they did with the safety chain and just like make the competition winner the sort of like prototypical head of household and just have them pick from there but also bailey is able to benefit from the fact that she kind of wipes her hands quite literally clean of the whole situation as much as she wouldn't want to lose somebody she could just be like Great. It wasn't my picks. Uh, I just made Victoria HOH and the rest yeah. is history. Hell, I, I deemed her HOH and she makes yeah. the renown. She gets to play next week, which is good. And I, But I like what you're saying, Kirsten, about like how Bailey should have should have had last say as to what went on here. This time, I think, ima like, imagine that everybody else gets to go in before her. You're probably looking at a world where everybody just goes in and changes the nominees to whatever they want. And then, like, all of the other roles kind of stay the same, or they're changing either nominee or HOH. She, but again, her going in last and having the power to then change whatever mm -hmm. she sees the board as and whatever's the most important to her to change, whether that's yeah. taking Kayla or Avery down or changing the HOH to, you know, something more preferred, it would have been more beneficial, a uh, more yeah. important power for what she won. I think, day. like, like, like I'm picturing it and this is just like very very loose brainstorm so it might just be like a crazy idea but that's what we're doing on Big Brother Canada now so like let's talk about a crazy idea so okay let's say like I guess Kay Kayla can't go in at all okay Avery's the first to go in or whatever Avery goes in and she can set up the whole board but then the next person will go in which I guess was Goose. I can't remember the order that well. So, then they yeah. can switch, like, they can make two swaps. Then the next person goes in. They can make two swaps, but they can't swap the category that the last person swapped. Like, if Goose swapped noms, you can't swap noms. That kind of so vibe. And then it goes, talking and about then like the, end, uh, the office game Yankee swap, right? Of like, oh, you can't pick the gift that was just swapped, but you have yeah. to make this other swap. But then now Bailey gets to come Mike in at the end, the, and she can game. make, like, three three switches and she can change anything she wants or something like that to get make it like quite powerful also then this would have taken seven episodes for them to get if if they had to go through with i mean this is why but it I should like, be I its like own that. show <laughs> <laughs> yeah i don't know. know but it's also like they could edit this show differently and they they could like if they hadn't bait and switched us and told us that it was an eviction it wouldn't be so annoying that it wasn't like they really advertised it and made it seem like someone was going home in this episode and then no one went like it's it's just be honest with us and give us appropriate expectations and then we won't be let down you know all right well let's move into our next pick here and it is indeed tola and this is where He's going to take advantage, right? He finally has that bit of power. It's the closest he's gotten to being in the head of household. And so he is going to strike. And he really wavers between, okay, do I take the shot at Kayla? Or since I know Todd's going right after me, do I lock in the pawn in Avery and just assume that Todd will put up Kayla? I think he was totally right to put up Kayla. Yes, I think he's going to obviously earn her wrath next episode because i could also imagine todd is totally gonna fess up and be like oh no when i came in your name was already up there uh but i do think that if you're tola yes todd has communicated this big plan to you but like considering your game up to this point how much can you trust that mm -hmm. they've been gunning for you as you ta both talked about before like how much more blood are you getting on your hands considering how many times you've been targeted by her alliance by just not outright targeting her yeah. yeah, no, it's I like and like oh no, go ahead. Go ahead, Kirsten. <laughs> You're good. <laughs> okay, yeah, I, I feel like something that we're often criticizing is when people do get power in Big Brother and they don't put up people that they're fine with. Like, even if you're putting up a pawn, you should never nominate someone who you're not totally fine with them leaving the house, right? Yep. And so I really respect going in and being like, nope, you know what? I'm not, you know dancing around it i'm just putting up exactly who my target is period let's move on it's going to be fine yeah i think tola and todd you can't take any in with the way they decide to go about this um, because they're the two ones that had this plan of like let's 
go for Kayla next. Um, the only way to ensure that Kayla would go home for sure is, uh, you know, on the block against one of her closest allies. Uh, Victoria is not an option at this point. Avery makes the most sense. So Todd has to do what he has to do. It's to create obviously uh, a riff because Avery did all of this. Uh, uh, Victoria did all of this, like saving him with the uh, crazy veto a couple weeks ago. Uh, Avery did not put Todd on the block when she very well could have and instead blindsided Matt, somebody who she felt good with. So there's going to be a lot that goes down in the next episode of trying to piece together what gets found out that he's the one that put Avery's name up there. She is not going to be very happy. And that's going to definitely even shift the house going forward of, of who Avery might've been targeting otherwise. Um, but again, to go back to it, Todd and Tola, you can't take any issue with what they did. The fact that they used the nominee spots and the fact of who they used it on. I don't know who else I would say that they should have used it on unless you're somebody who would argue that they should be going for Anthony um, because of of course, there's still always going to be the factor of when do we take out Anthony? What's the right time? But given how the game is going at the moment where Anthony's number one just got evicted and this all powerful group of uh, uh, the three of them specifically plus Bailey, like they're starting to look like they're going to run the game. You have to take a shot. And what's so interesting as well about the structure of this game is like Victoria was crowned the HOH, but because she finished at a much lower position, these two guys were basically the HOH. They were the ones that made the two nominations. And so that's what makes it so interesting. And that's also what I really like about this as well, is that as much as we don't want it to necessarily come down to competitions in a social strategy game, I do like that it does benefit competitors as well. That like, okay, these two guys are rewarded for finishing higher by essentially getting the right to make their nominations. And we get, we, we're so screwed here as audience members of Lexus not finishing above Todd, because if the people that went to do nominations were T uh, Tola and Lexus, oh my God, would have loved to see where Lexus lied uh, after everything just on like if she would have put Avery up as, you know, a fellow hot chocolate uh, member, or if she would have stuck with the women and done something else, the whole beginning of the episode was, will she turn on them? She's considering it for sure. Uh, but she misses it by one spot of having the power to do so. So she ends up just, uh, oh, Tola playing the veto. Well, Anthony though, assumes that that might be the case, which could be interesting, right? Like we saw with Anthony's first HOH, how much random rumors might factor into the way people think about it. If Anthony decides for whatever reason, like, yeah, we're really going to get this narrative started that Lexus was the one to take the first sh shot against hot chocolate instead of me. Like, that could be really dangerous. But like you said, Matt, so Lexus walks in. She's shocked that Kayla and Avery are nominated, but it's probably also a little bit like serves you right. She uh, and, she, yep. and she basically just picks Tola as a POV player and says, OK, I hope that Anthony will pick me. And so Anthony comes in here. And yeah, Kirsten, what did you make of sort of him trying to backwards reason what happened and is that something that these players should do considering that these opinions may not be informed whatsoever uh, yeah i think that everybody going in should and probably was trying to work it all out but i think that anthony's just the most successful at that type of thinking right now and so i, I think that's why we saw it from his perspective as well um but yeah they should absolutely be trying to figure out what's going on because any piece of information you can get in big brother is useful, right? And I don't know. I think I also think he made the right choice taking Goose's vote away in that spot. Well, I, I think, also go ahead, sorry, Matt. Matt. I was just gonna say, as far as Lexus goes, we're, we're we're on her decision at the moment. I think the biggest thing that I take away from this is is seeing so up until this point, we've not like a lot of Lexus and Tola, but there's been enough chatter of the uh like I guess on the drops or just in general of like Alex, uh, Lexis doesn't dislike Tola. She doesn't feel bad with him in the game. Um, and obviously she's got these negative feelings towards hot chocolate after they all just sent Matt home. Um, so seeing that she puts Tola in no competition saying if Tola or I end up winning the veto, then she feels like the nominations are, are going to be okay. And she's fine with these two staying on the block because for kind of obvious reasons at this point, but Anthony was still an option to go up. Um, and I know she feels great with Anthony after, you know, a Anthony, Lexis and Matt were like, a, you know, you know, by the time that Matt goes home. So just seeing yeah, that Lexus, Lexus is so after busted. the Matt eviction, we see that Lexus literally goes up to Anthony is like, I'm so glad you're here. Thank you. They they had a whole cry fest the day that Matt was leaving. They were, they were sobbing in each other's arms, all three of them. So Anthony uh, and Anthony are going to work together, you know, far as they for the, in the coming weeks. But again, Lexus and Tola, I think is going to be a very intriguing pairing going into whatever this vote ends up being. If Tola ends up on the block, is Lexus going to send home Avery or Tola? And now it seems like it could be either way. 
Yeah, what did we make as we take like a little bit of a detour from the detour that was this game structure about like <laughs> where Lexus goes from here? Because the women are trying their best, admittedly, right? They're giving the whole pump up speech of like, he's going to get taken care of out there. We're going to take care of you in here. You're going to see him and it's going to be the best day. But I don't know, Kirsten. Maybe it's just because I'm like an emotionally petty son of a bitch. But like, how can, if you're Lexus, how can you not be like, what the hell did you just do? Yeah, I, I think that like, for Lexus, it's fine. She wants to forgive, but she's not going to forget. And if they were so concerned about Lexus and the boys, then maybe she should have been one of the women targeted earlier in the season over like, I don't know, Donna, if they were so concerned about someone who might not go straight with the girls Alliance, you know? Just yeah, two, Matt, what two do things you think? there. Like Lexus did a fantastic job the past couple of days from my perspective of not making overtly obvious with the rest of the women that she's mad about what's happening. Like she was very obviously upset, but not once did I ever see her in a conversation of even like really pushing too hard because she knew what they were going to do. Maybe in the back of her mind, she knew it was better that this happened now than her having to do it later. Like if when going like kind of it had to happen at some point um and she again she she put on a a good front of like i'm not devastated by this and if she turns on them it's not very obvious that it's going to happen to them um and then as far as victoria goes with all of this she's been doing this all season she the way that she comforts people in times of like their distress you got girl like canada's gonna love you you're the move is gonna be great and legendary and you're gonna be so good without matt in this game you're gonna win and then he's gonna sweep you up and propose to you on finale night and girl you're gonna be the player of the season like she does this whole song and dance with everybody to make them feel better and from our perspective it's just so obvious how fake it but like i don't know what they're you know what they're thinking it's it's a lot yeah like we also have the internet and a bird's eye view so it's a little different obviously for them yeah it's so, the same as like I feel like a lot of Anthony's pep talks seem super canned, but they they're always yeah, work. They're, so yeah, they're they both have obviously different styles of how they go into this. Like Anthony will just pump you up and be like, "You're a legend, bro! Like you got this! Like like and everyone's going like." It, but they're saying the same thing. So, oh, hundred percent, yeah. And I almost wonder if she's like picking up on that. I would say from so. because Anthony, he's probably right? doing, that's the vibe I'm getting. It yeah. He's like, we're going to be, yeah. you know, we're going we're gonna to make history. The two returnees come back and they're going to let us get to the end. So I would yeah. say she's definitely last getting in, last out. Him. We've got this. Right. Mm -hmm. It's like this thing of like, you know, what works for thee does not work for me. Like you're trying to do what I do to others and that can't work. Uh, and it's also interesting to always watch. Like every time we see Anthony handing out scripts for, okay, here's what you're going to do. I just find it so interesting because like, Yes, on the one hand, you're saying, oh, my God, how are these people actually buying it? But I feel like in a game full of variables that is Big Brother, especially early on, like, yes, yeah, sometimes you want that backbone, right? Sometimes you want some sort of skeletal structure. And granted, it's not coming from an impartial party, but sometimes you do need somebody being like, all right, here's what you need to say, running it through from A to Z. And let's talk about Anthony on that note, because I really liked the decision that he made here, where it was less so about him... Because it wasn't left with a lot of options, right? The HOH was decided. The two nominees were decided. So it was kind of just left with the scraps. And so it's less so for him about the roles and it's more about the people. And basically, he's looking at those that are left and he's saying, okay, who could work for me either as a vote or as a possible player in the competition to either change up the structure if I don't want hot chocolate to go or not if I do? And so I do think Todd could have been a good choice, right? As Todd vocalizes, like, he's not sure what Lexus will do to him because he was one of the key pivotal swing votes, at least what we saw, that sent Matt home. And so from that perspective, you could be like, yeah, Todd, you're of no use to us. Like, you're not going to vote with me. You're always going to vote against me. So let's take your vote off the table. But as he mentioned, like, Elijah ain't doing it in competitions, especially compared to someone like Todd, who just came in third place in the most recent competition. And mm -hmm. so as a result for the fifth week in a row, I believe Elijah will not be voting on eviction night. And unfortunately there is a very good chance in my opinion, that that man will sit on the block once again, because the easiest thing to do if you're Victoria, and I think we'll talk about like what her options are moving forward, but if he's not going to vote anyway, he might as well not vote as a nominee. Yeah. Very true. And it's also just like, 
even when it's been an option to get rid of Goose, people say they're like, oh, "What we're gonna get rid of Goose?" Like, huh? He just is kind of irrelevant. I think in talking through this, I'm now thinking Lexus made a mistake in what she decided to put on the board, putting Tola on veto because it didn't even cross my mind until now that whoever goes like it's like you're like plugging the holes of the board of like where it could be dis yeah. disastrous for your mm -hmm. game and the nominee spots are already taken you need to make sure that somebody else doesn't put your name in that no vote spot you need to make sure you have mm -hmm. the power to vote and lexus going in there and not filling that spot means that anybody could go in there next and put lexus's name on the board in that no vote spot and suddenly she has no say in what happens this week unless she wins the veto but even still you're not going to have a vote so that seemed again like the most important hole that needed to be plugged at that point i think Anthony, you know is, is filling it with goose for a reason as he explains and as mike you were talking about but at the very least i think like by far and away like he needed to put somebody on the board in that spot to just make sure he was good mm -hmm. Well, I think also what it ends up setting up, whether consciously or not, is like, okay, here's your renom. Just because, again, what use is this person for not voting? It, and especially when, okay, there's a chance that the POV is going to be used. Here's someone to serve up on a silver platter. And so from that capacity, like, if you're looking at an Anthony backdoor, I say, like, make him that no vote position. Like, sweeten the pot a little bit by saying, well, he's not even going to vote. You might as well throw them up on the block and see what happens. But again, they didn't have necessarily the foresight yeah. to look ahead with that move. But as we'll talk about what Victoria is going to do with this renom, I think probably the leader in the clubhouse is going to be an Elijah renom just because, Ooh. listen, a man is a hoot or a honk, but like, I, I don't know what value he brings to an eviction night. I see. I think the big problem is we got kind of a preview of what's to come and it looks like he is pitching backdooring Anthony. And I think Victoria is going to tell Anthony that Goose said that. And then Anthony is going to convince Victoria to put Goose up. And Goose will go home for saying Anthony's name. I, I thought Goose at first as well. But again, as we're all talking through this, it's it's the, the possibilities are coming into my head of like, okay, well, why would you put Goose on the block? Goose is already like power has been stripped from him this week. He doesn't have a vote. He's not a player in what's going to happen here. Victoria has the opportunity to take that power away from another person and put them in a position where they're not going to be able mm -hmm. to vote. Somebody like Atola, I mean, at this point, I think it's going to become pretty clear to her that Tola and Todd were the ones who put those nominations in place. Goose not voting. Goose is already on their side, essentially. They pulled Goose back over mm -hmm. last week by saying, you know, you're, we're going to keep you. You're safe. Like, come back over with us. We know you messed up the week before, but like, work with us. We still feel good with you. So getting rid of him in a spot where, again, he already has no power right now when you have the opportunity to put a Todd or a Tola up where you don't know where they're going to vote. I think she has to do that. I think at this but, point she has to cut ties. With you, you ha when you but pull I, the trigger, I though, you have to make sure you have three bullets in the chamber. Yeah, you have the, to the, have those three votes. The thing though, Matt, like what you're saying makes sense from a strategic standpoint, but it's completely neglecting the real life friendship of Dougie and, and Victoria and Goose saying Anthony's name. If, if she tells Anthony about that, he said that, which I'm sure she will because she leaks information. Anthony is going to do everything in his power to make sure that Goose goes up and goes out because he said Anthony's name. Goose has won an HOH before and he could win it again. And he's talking about targeting Anthony. I, Anthony does not have a tolerance for people saying his name. And he you're will not absolutely allow right about that. But Victoria has already proved twice consecutively that she doesn't care what Anthony has to say when she used that veto, despite what Anthony wanted her to do. She she used the veto anyway. I, just, she, I, 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 I think I, it's, it's going to be different though, just because he's saying Anthony's name as like target him right now. Let's backdoor him, which is just a little different than like, oh well, we've got these two different auxiliary pieces that we could nominate. I'm going to go with the one I'd prefer over what Anthony prefers because I think Anthony and V both do have the primary uh, objective of keeping both. Anthony and Victoria in the game. And so I, I just think it's going to play out a little bit differently than kind of the proxy wars that we've been seeing. So a couple things about this. A, as I mentioned before, remember, Avery is one of Victoria's closest allies. She has to make sure this is a shot to kill. And yes, it's only three votes, but considering how divided the house is, she needs those three votes. And she knows that she would have Bailey and Kayla but does she know she can have anybody else? And so mm -hmm. if she takes the shot against Anthony, she has to make sure she has one of Todd or Alexis. Oh, like and putting Anthony on the block? Yeah. 
Well, there's no way, no world. Yeah, no she's way. she's never gonna do that. That's not right. happening yet. I mean, should she? Probably. <laughs> yeah, but like sure, sure that, that, that's yeah. just also like to me, that's just in the realm of things that are never going to happen. Yeah. No, I yeah, think but- more realistically, she continues to try. To, and, and this is, I, I'm kind of feeling myself firmly land on this side of, I think, even though she just chipped away at one of Anthony's pieces, I feel like she has the chance to do it again. And she's playing so bloodthirsty for herself, like she has been for weeks now. I feel like she does again. I think she takes the shot at Tola, thinking that, you know, Todd's still with Bailey, Tola's still an Anthony piece. And she has to, at that point, so the votes, like you said, Mike, are Kayla and... um and Bailey, Bailey are locked to keep Avery. This is again, uh, Victoria's closest ally in the house is Avery that's on the block. And if she makes the wrong call here, that Avery goes home. Remember how Bailey was desperately trying to save herself and convinced Victoria to, to make a move other than the one she was going to make that Anthony wanted to make. And she ended up listening to Bailey, making the correct move, keeping Bailey in the house. So we're in the exact kind of position of if I put the wrong person up, my number one Avery is about to go home. So that third vote would have to come from either, wait, no, so yeah, five votes. Anthony, Todd, or Lexis would then need to vote for Tola to go over Avery. It's going to be tough. Yeah, the other thing is we have to look to the optics of the jury. Now, it hasn't been confirmed yet. Maybe it's because we haven't gotten a formal eviction, but our assumption is we are in nine people. We're going to get a jury of seven and a final two. Victoria was the first member of the jury of, in her season. She knows better than everybody, like, the message that you send to the jury. And also look at the fact of, yes, the past couple of weeks has been Victoria, Avery, and Kayla undermining Anthony and Lexus to a certain extent at every turn. But they keep coming back being like, yeah, but you know what? At the end of the day, I didn't put you up. I'm still loyal to hot chocolate. There is still this visage of no we're still sticking true to us we might chip away at any other options you may have but we're gonna stick loyal to each other at the end of the day if victoria is the one to draw that first blood and nominate someone like lexus for instance and throw them up and they go that's gonna send a very bad message about victoria that's going to say like not only did you break this alliance that could arguably be bigger than the game, but you also broke an alliance that, again, you said you had our backs 100%. And even though Spicy V is a bit of the scorpion and the frog, it would be a really tough thing to, I think, endanger her chances of winning almost immediately. So I agree. It's a really tough calculus as to what's the best option to keep Avery safe. And from that capacity, I think it's sort of the guy that really isn't tight with anybody. You you put up someone like Goose, they just betrayed the Anthony and Tola and Lexus side. And I think it's a little bit of what our our friend Rob Cesarino did once upon a time with Christy back in the Amazon of like, this guy's going to both sides. He really doesn't stand for anything. Do we want to keep this guy in the game? You could also argue to use a big brother example. This is the very argument that Maggie used with Howie to put up James back in season six. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, and despite me thinking that <laughs> despite me thinking that Tola is the better option for her to keep Avery in the house, I think certainly Goose is the next most likely of what she could do. And if she doesn't get persuaded in the correct dire- uh, direction, again, based on what I'm reading to be her, her best move here, then Goose goes up. Uh, she's looking at a world where Todd and Tola are like locked on sending out one of the two women that are still left on the block in Avery. She's banking on hot chocolate to then be on her side and vote to send Goose home. When that doesn't happen... Then, Mike, almost she gets the upper hand in what you're talking about of like, yeah. well, then they're breaking, you know, the, yeah. the pack. I mean, they're not sending home. Well, no, they are. They'd be sending home Avery and they're the ones that are breaking hot chocolate. So she has that in her back pocket going forward. I don't think she's by any means, you know, screwed if Avery goes home. She has done such a good job in this game of keeping so many people in like close to her. So instead of having Avery as number one, I think Kayla shifts to that spot and Bailey becomes even more important than she already is. So, I mean... Again, Victoria has played very well with these connections. It'll be so, I'm so, I want to know, you know, what's, what's going on in there? What happened? Well, Who she and on? the thing too is if Victoria wasn't, like, the, here, here's the problem. She's so bombastic, right? So like Avery goes home, Victoria will be going absolutely off and is not able to play in the next stage of age, right? If she, if she wasn't reactive in that way, I think she could play kind of like a wounded puppy. Like, right. oh, I've lost my number one. Like, I'm nothing to worry about. But I, I don't think she has – I don't think she – she likes to act and she likes to perform. But I, I think she likes to be powerful in a way that 
that would not be, you know? Yeah, she can't be like Dan Giesling after Brian and Steven went exactly. out. Just kind of like lying low for a couple of weeks so people forget about it. Because usually, almost always in these social strategy games, it is always the half measure, right? It's like, oh, we took out this person's closest ally. They're fine. They've got nobody. We don't yeah. need to worry about them for a long time. And as a result, they make their way to the end. But to your point, Chris did like, Victoria love her, but she cannot yeah. leave well enough alone. She she's not Dan after uh, Brian goes home. She's Dan after the twenty four hours of solitary confinement. <laughs> and if we get Victoria's funeral, I'm on board. There is one more decision that we should talk about. It's my new one, but still interesting to sort of end the the chain of actual choices that happen, which is Victoria. So she is left again with only a couple options. Basically, she has to deem between Lexis, Todd, and Anthony who is guaranteed to play in the POV and who's going to take the slot pass. She says that she's going to give Anthony the slot pass as sort of like a form of repayment. I agree. I think especially for a returning player, like it's basically worth a hill of beans at that point, which they can eat because they're not going to be a have not. I mean, again, if Victoria is really trying to press Anthony here, throw him in the POV and see what happens if he wins it, because there are two members of hot chocolate up on the block there. Yeah. So at that point, the only people that are left, right, are are Todd and Lexis. So, I mean, what is it, what's the difference at that point? Like, she's either giving Todd a slot pass or Lexis. She could give it to Lexis as like a, hey, sorry, girl, we voted out your man. But like, uh, you know, here's uh, no slot for the rest of the way through. But I do feel like maybe just her knowing Anthony on a personal level uh, knows that he would much rather have uh, no slot for the rest of the season than a chance to play. in. Like, I think she's literally just mm -hmm. trying to show a sign of friendship. Like she kind of says. All right. So we go through our final couple formalities, right? The set dressing of having Avery come in and make the choice that ultimately doesn't matter. Just kind of setting deck chairs on the Titanic. I did like Elijah going in and reacting in real time to basically like, you could follow where his eyes were going on the board considering like the first thing he saw was like, Oh, this is going on. Oh crap. What happened? And I can make it out. Yeah, he was excited, and then he was scared, and then he was excited and scared. Then he just sort of, like, said, say la vie upon having no eviction vote once again. But we get, you know, Orissa then running through the rolls again, basically just to have, like, Kayla react in the moment, Which right? Was so like, cruel. Like, they even swapped the order of Kayla and Avery being revealed. They showed Avery first, while the whole thing is so cinematic because Kayla is crying. She's distraught. Uh, and then they show Avery on the block before Kayla, where we know that Kayla's coming next. But, oh, my God, it's brutal. Yeah, I mean, I guess there is appeal, right, Kirsten? And, like, okay, now Bailey gets to see what happened afterwards. But the other thing that I was interested by is, like, I imagine they couldn't explicitly say what they did. Um, but, like, people were certainly saying things, right? They were sitting down saying, you won't believe what's in there. Uh, so I guess maybe they were led to build stuff up, even though they couldn't exactly say what happened to ruin the surprise. Yeah, it was, I, I feel like most people just stayed pretty quiet other than kind of like, wow, uh, vibes. I feel like it wasn't until Victoria came out that she was like, what happened? Like, I'm pissed. Yeah, and yeah, Avery, I think, said, like, uh, co true colors being shown, I think yeah. she spits Which out her way back. I thought, I'm sorry, I thought that was such a stupid thing to say, because it's like, yeah, you can make your best guesses as to who cast whom in what roles, but, like, we don't actually know anybody's true colors, Avery, because you don't know for sure who who nominated you, so, let, like, let's chill a little bit. Mm-hmm. You were just the HOH. You're part of this very powerful group that seems again to be running yeah. the house. Uh, back door like like colors. It's big target. A... So. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. again, that's that's what I love about this queuing system that I think what hopefully an episode plus of drama will be built out of is like everyone whispering to each other. Okay. What did you see on the board when you came in and like seeing how the purposeful miscommunications are going to happen. It's very uh, something like Mafia or Blood on the Clock Tower, where like everyone has a specific role, but you can lie about what your role is in conjunction to others, and it just sets the entire chain apart. Again, I think the queuing aspect, as much as you want the vote to be secret, was probably my favorite part of this twist. It was almost like something out of the genius, where it's like, I'm lined up to do this thing, and knowing who's behind me, I'm going to make this move specifically because of that. It was a really fun aspect that ultimately leads to a Big Brother-esque situation, Victoria is the HOH, Kayla and Avery are the nominees, and they jump immediately into a power of veto that's like, fine, it's drink three glasses of quote-unquote blood, unlock a combination lock, and solve a puzzle. It's like the last third of a survivor yeah. challenge, usually. Like, 
Ch- chugging is like a big Canadian thing. So. Oh, really? Makes sense. Oh, yeah. It's a, like people here can drink their drinks fast. It's it's <laughs> it's a whole thing. They went all out with this whole episode and did such a good job theming wise. And then they were like, here's a block puzzle. Yeah, like, like yeah. not a scary well, they, block well, puzzle, they not a murderous like a, block puzzle. They did sort of have torture spikes. Yeah, they had the, the spikes and they were like it. covered the spikes. I mean, okay, you know, a small but but I don't know. Like we were already doing so much, but like even the the blood drinks. Like okay, we're keeping the theming going, but then here's some colored blocks. Small, yeah, small I mean, but like. I don't know. I, I think in this spot they were always going to do something like this or like similar to how double or triple eviction vetoes play out where it's like you run back and forth and you collect the thing. So it's like this was better than running back and forth. I'll take it. I mean, oh. ma- yeah, imagine it was a longer competition with the three minutes they had to show us the whole competition. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it could have gotten ghoul shul. Uh, so then we end up, Kayla mm-hmm. ends up winning it, even though Tola certainly trying his best. Oh, uh, yeah. Also, we're very sure that that wasn't blood in the glasses, right? Otherwise, these people no. are like steel-willed AF if they can just down it, no problem. Well, I'm, I'm pretty sure if it was real blood, um, there's some sort of like w- occupational health and safety rule against that. Um, Survivor Africa, I, they got to chug cow's blood straight from the cow. That is true. That was also a very different time. <laughs> yes. uh, it, it was it was different. Um, I think that there was probably like some cornstarch and food coloring in the water. So it's probably like a little bit thick, sweet, and it was probably really sweet. Normally fake blood is extremely sweet. Missed opportunity to have Godfrey host. <laughs> get, exactly. Get his Just blood have on, him walk in. <laughs> on someone's hands. Yeah. I'm trying to think like who would have been a good alumni to step in and temporarily make an appearance during the veto competition. Well, I mean, you have to think about like what, which aspect of the competition. Cause if it's about chugging drinks, like John party, Mm. Should be there, or like Emmett when he like uh, down those glasses of milk. Oh yeah, all the milk. If it was three glasses of milk, it would have to be Emmett for sure. Yeah, because I'm also trying to think. Like, I don't think there's any movie affiliated Canadian alumni, right? Like, I'm just thinking Matt to Australian Survivor. Like, Eden would have been a perfect host for this if this had an equivalent in Australian Survivor. Well, because it, it's like there are you know Big Brother Canada contestants that are actors, but none of them are like huge yet like um kiki from season seven is Mm. constantly going to auditions and showing up on netflix shows but like not to the level where it where the audience of big brother canada would immediately know why she was the one hosting you know what i mean i will also say on that note something that i really appreciated about this episode was very limited use of confessionals like once we got past sort of the normalcy post eviction stuff and we got into the massacre itself No confessionals, almost made to play out in like, quote unquote, real time. So I imagine almost double eviction style will probably get a lot of confessionals next episode in retrospect being like, so this is why I picked this and maybe showing some flashbacks there. But yeah, I was a little surprised that, you know, Big Brother Canada even edits their eviction shows, obviously. I was happily surprised, especially considering the way Big Brother confessionals usually go, even in Canada, that we didn't really get any talking heads this episode. Yeah, no, I think that's definitely what the Tuesday episode is of just the post double eviction play out of what happened next. Um, and at this point, why would they have the eviction shown on Tuesday? Um, you would think that like they're going to show it on Wednesday at this point, and hopefully, like if we don't have an HOH by the end of Wednesday's episode, let me just even let me talk to somebody. Um, just to like like I'll what are we up. doing? What are we doing? Like to push through this week? Like we thought it was going to be all in one episode, which to be fair, it's not like I had any idea what was going to happen in Tuesday and Wednesday after this week. Like I, I guess maybe in theory you would think they're just going to do another cycle this was like a double eviction but this is essentially just one cycle that by the way all happened i think on last tuesday night it is now sunday night and this in theory all happened on tuesday night unless the timeline like unless they like teased it on well so they went to bed so then maybe this happened like Wednesday I morning, think I think it happened at like eight in the morning, and they're calling yeah. it movie night massacre, so, but it happened yeah. during the day. And it's movie <laughs> night massacre. When two thirds of your branding is in quotations, there might be a problem. Yeah, because the yeah. whole Friday, the whole no Friday, we got no update. The whole Thursday update was all after Matt left, and then it ended with the sirens going off. So we mm. didn't see we didn't see anything from like the daytime Wednesday. This must have happened, I, I guess, that day, but. Whatever's going on in that house Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, well, you know, think, we'll never know. Matt, I, I think that the last two evictions have actually been recorded on Tuesday and then so released too, yeah. on Wednesday. Yeah. So like we don't even – so this happened Wednesday day. 
and then we've seen nothing and potentially there could be two people either like in a cabin in Muskoka or in a hotel room waiting to go home. And we just don't even know who they are because the episodes haven't aired. They could have filmed the rest of the season by now, for all we know. Uh, just just well, dropping things. And that's the other thing, too. That, it's uh, like, Big Brother Australia season, right? Where they, like, basically <laughs> yeah. filmed it all ahead of time and then yeah. like, just live feeds. Well, but we if no there's idea. not going to be live feeds and, there's, and the uh, evictions aren't going to be live and all this, why not? Why don't they just go film it over, like, a freaking weekend and then give us the episodes when they're ready to have them and whatever additional material they want to provide to us. Cause it's like, there's no point in it being live right now. Rissa's yeah, so already we- on vacation, sitting on a beach. She, you know, we are done. We wrapped. Sunwing got her covered. <laughs> yeah. She, she did her like requisite stuff with, uh, you know, a- ADR the people's names in there. It's fine. I'm going to go sip a Mai Tai while you all do this movie night massacre thing. But so, you know, we'll get at some point, someone evicted here because yeah, I guess the big question is if Tuesday night is veto ceremony and eviction, are they just doing like a super condensed one hour episode on Wednesday of like, and here was this other round where someone won HOH and someone won veto and then someone else went home. Who no. knows? We might even get like on the Tuesday episode, it, we might get like the rest of this and then the start of the next cycle. And yeah, then like, Wednesday like we get, finishes we get, the cycle. Yeah. We get like an HOH on Tuesday night and then Wednesday is the veto and eviction. I could see that yeah. possibly. I mean, I if they do want to speed it up, it. then possibly, but it's just very confusing. But they have we to thought this whole thing was up. tonight. The show yeah. ends in a month and there's nine people in the house. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It was it was all about them condensing week one and two. I know we don't love when they do the first eviction in episode two back to back, but looking back, it's kind of a necessary evil, or we find ourselves in this sort of uh Miranese knot right now. Yeah. yeah. Who knows? Well, congratulations to Kayla, wins her second veto, and this time when she really freaking needed it, because I think safe to say, had she not won it, if either Avery won it or someone else did, she was as good as gone, whether she realizes it or not. I am intrigued to see how she is going to approach this in particular, because I do think we've seen it in fits and starts, but like, Kayla has some spice to her as well, for lack of a better term. So I'm going to really be intrigued to see if she Rupert style goes like who the hell nominated me and just go out from there. But we've been speculating about this a little while back that we assume that Victoria would probably end up nominating someone like Goose, maybe someone like Tola, maybe not going for necessarily the other options just for various different reasons. What do we think right now the votes would be? Let's say it's Elijah and Avery, do we think Victoria and company are able to get one of Todd, Tola, and Anthony on board to evict Goose over Avery? To evict Goose. Um, well, so it really, uh, of course, comes down to hot chocolate. Anthony Cause, and Because also remember, really like, yeah. Victoria only needs three, because even if Elijah doesn't vote, she has the tiebreaker. There's six votes, correct. Yeah, so they still need the third vote. It's going to come down to, I mean... Does Todd stick with Bailey is a question. And then does hot chocolate stick together and say, we're keeping Avery in the house. I mean, at a certain point, Anthony may decide it it just makes more sense for him to cut off one of Victoria's numbers. And she's doing a lot of work to cut off his. Um, She wanted Tola to go that week. She obviously got rid of Matt last week alongside Avery. So it may make sense to do that. It's just this, this next episode is going to be so telling of, of how these conversations shake out. I mean, Todd already kind of planted his flag as to, I am going to prioritize like Tola and trying to get one of these women out over anything else. So he feels like a lost cause. Anthony and Lexus are the question marks. What do you think, Kirsten? I think Matt's right. I, like, I, I, I can't even see another way for it to play out. It's it's yeah. like I, I feel so bad sitting on the fence and like well it comes down to these two like what are they gonna do? I don't know I have no idea um like Avery and Goose which one is better for let's say Anthony's game if Anthony could be that third vote or, or I mean for for Alexis too Goose is not looking out for the two of them where they could still be convinced that Avery does have hot chocolate's best interests in minds and Avery will continue right. to go for like Bailey, uh, Todd Tola, even if they don't necessarily believe it, they have reason to potentially believe it because of hot chocolate where what are they keeping goose in the game for? They already can kind of see that goose was drifting to Victoria's side anyway. I don't know. It, it just seems to me like, I just think Elijah's reputation up to this point is sort of like, 
if you stand for nothing, what will you fall for? Or even when he was HOH, it went pretty damn badly for him, considering that, like, you could say, oh, yeah, Ale Alexis will keep him. But then there was that entire thing where, like, she didn't use the veto when he wanted her to use the veto because she got her head turned around about, like, Matt wanted to put up Kayla. So I, I just feel like, and maybe, again, I'm speaking out of my butt because I'm not sure entirely, like, the relationship that he's garnered. But I feel like looking at even just these two most recent HOHs in Avery and Goose, like, what Avery was able to accomplish, yes, it was a bit more of a stab in the back maneuver, but I feel like it was done sort of at and with the support of so many people, as opposed to Elijah, who I feel like, from my perspective, kind of walked in and walked out with the same number of allies. Mm -hmm. He's he's a total, you know, at this like not to be super harsh, but like a total nothing, uh, you know, in the game. Um, even when he won power, they found a way for it to not be important, and you know, for him to just continue yeah. to be a pawn in everybody else's games going forward. So, um, at, at a certain point. People will cut him just in favor of an ally staying in the house, which could be this week. Um, but again, it just comes down to if Anthony and Alexis decide, you know, um, I don't know. Anthony, Todd, Tola, and Goose. New pretty boys? Question mark. <laughs> Your faces say it all. Um, I mean, <laughs> I'm just I guess looking at a you... world where Anthony tries to reclaim power within within this house because lately he's been losing a lot of it. I I do. I just think that. I think Anthony, it's like hard because Anthony sees what he's losing a little bit, but he doesn't, I like, I just don't think he was able to fully grasp that it was Victoria's fault until it was a little bit too late to grasp like enough power to totally abandon that ship. And he just tends to such loyalty to his real alliance. That it's like, ah, I think, it, I think he's, I, I think it's just gonna be Anthony and, and Victoria Continuing to have like proxy wars, but I don't see either of them actually going for the other well, really at any point. The other thing is that something that the pretty boys were able to do of the many things to great effect was the fact that they won a great majority of the competitions yeah. this season. And listen, Tola picked up a veto and Todd's certainly no slouch as they showed. But like, does Anthony really want to hitch his wagons to these people? Does he no. want to draw a line when it's like, oh, but these guys probably won't win HOH to protect me at the end of the day, and that just leaves me exposed. He's going to have to bet on himself a lot more if he sets that up. Uh, that being said, like I could see him still want to keep options open because it does seem like Tola and Todd are starting to ramp up that competitive aspect a little bit, but these competitions have also been fairly good, especially compared to US, in like, being pretty equal opportunists. So there's still a very fair shot that, like, if you do that, a woman's going to win HOH, and now they have the biggest excuse to put you up. I think Lexus is going to follow Anthony's lead, uh, is my best guess going into this next, uh, going into whatever this vote ends up being. I think she sticks by him and what he decides. He obviously has such a mind for the game, and I think he'll impart on her what he thinks their best move collectively is. And she's still in such a vulnerable spot, having just lost Matt. Matt like imparted very strongly, like stick with Anthony, and they're going to uh, be together. So it really just comes down for Anthony of um, he knows he has to chip away pieces at Victoria's side. Is this the time to start doing so? And I really kind of think it is. I think Goose is, again, so uh, such a nothing piece and could be persuaded where Avery is locked in alongside Victoria. So I kind of feel like if it's Goose, that Avery might go. All right. Instinct. Well, there's my there's my thought. Yeah, well, <laughs> I, I, I just think if Anthony hears like Goose said his name, it, it's going to make a big difference. I don't know. Well, we'll see as all the fallout will occur and there will be some sort of eviction. Listen, the teaser did have Arissa saying, I have the results to find out who didn't survive the night. Now, that being said, one of the reasons why I think we kind of sat in our hands for most of this evening is because we kind of were led to believe with the advertising that there would be an eviction tonight. So who's to say, but hopefully we'll have a lot more to talk about. Regardless, I do think it's going down and I would not be surprised if this is something to shake up the game a little bit. Either Avery is evicted and one of the biggest, you know, tops of the hierarchy now goes to the bottom or someone like Goose is evicted, but the leading trio has ha now had a major shakeup to it. Todd and Tola have tried to land a shot and ultimately ended up missing after trying to work the middle. And it could set up a really interesting few weeks to follow. 
Matt, Kirsten, anything else from the two of you as we wrap up Movie Night Madness here? Uh, Massacre. I almost came up with a better name for it. Mm. I was more madness than a massacre, wasn't it? Um, no, I'm just really excited to see what happens next. I think a lot is going to happen in the next month. And it's just how much of it are we actually going to be allowed to see uh, that's going to dictate how exciting it is. Yeah, this has been, it, it's been good for what we've been able to see of it. Um, a couple of dailies ago, there was some Anthony versus Spicy V. And when you get two returnees in a house, I mean, or any amount of returnees in the house, the worst thing is when they're going to stick together and, you know, try to work together towards the end. These two, I think, while they still are not directly going to shoot at one another, I do think that uh, it's very clear to to one another that the other does not have their best interests in mind, whether it's just continuing to pick away at each other's pieces all the way down to however far we get down to. Eventually, a shot will be taken and a vote will be cast for Anthony for Victoria to leave or vice versa. And I think that, you know, over the next, again, over, over the course of the next month, uh, watching to see how that finishes out is going to be the most compelling part of all of this, alongside a couple of players that are still in the house that are very worthwhile contenders for the crown so um, i'm intrigued uh the fact that we probably will not have dailies over the next couple of days is very annoying but as i tweeted if we're still watching this show and following along we're doing this to ourselves and we know what pain we're inflicting upon ourselves so i can't even be frustrated at this point I do, yeah, i'm doing we, it to myself we are these cubes lying upon the spikes uh yes. self-immolating a uh, self-imposing also here's a comment from benjamin it says bb can's official twitter says quote second half of movie night will be on tuesday so they better have an eviction on tuesday or else i'm done believing their advertising so mm. yeah listen fool me once shame on me but if they are claiming the second half of, of movie night madness massacre that seems to indicate to me some sort of eviction so then what's Wednesday just like 20 minutes of they have to do the HOH at that point and then just continued fallout think, from the massacre? I just I wonder if we're going to get the rest of the massacre plus an HOH and then like they zoom through another cycle on Wednesday. Mm -hmm. I just don't. Yeah. I, I feel like they need to send two people home this week. I, I think they have to. Uh, I believe the finale is what, three weeks well, from Wednesday, I think so. Like you guys said, a massacre does indicate maybe multiple people going home so imagine mm -hmm. the twist at the end of of the tuesday night episode is so you think that's it <laughs> but one more yeah. of you is gonna go oh it's the exact opposite Man, of imagine the end of one imagine mm -hmm. if it comes down to it and they're like haha you thought you were voting actually both nominees just go home bye okay. yeah exactly well we shall see no matter what the two of you made an absolute killing over the course of this podcast. I know that we are without our usual leader in Taryn and we were a bit building the plane as we flew trying to talk through this very new game and how to play it ideally versus what actually played out. But I certainly had a lot of fun getting to do this. I hope everyone who's watching live got to do so as well. Almost 1800 people watching right now I think brother canada it. no way yeah holy smokes hey, i mean I, th I think like it's interesting this is again something i've never seen in the franchise before uh just as a game structure or even just a deviation to something completely different and it invigorated me for a season i have been enjoying up to this point even if i have been a bit more casually watching things from afar from a strategic perspective like I really like the repercussions of what this might mean, whether for Big Brother Canada 13 or, again, if this was a soft pilot to release as its own reality competition show, go to it. Let's see what happens. Throw in some of those swap uh, percolations that Kirsten was talking about, and, like, you might have a show going on, Shark. So we yeah. shall see. But I know we all have plenty of podcasts going on in the tank. Let's close out with some plugs. Matt, we'll start with you. What do you have going on? Well, uh, what a blast. You guys uh, were a lot of fun to break this down with. I'm so happy to have been on this podcast with you both. Um, I'm on Twitter at Matt Ligori, where, um, you know, dropping some thoughts as the dailies come out whenever the dailies do come out because they're not coming out that often um especially when a twist is involved who knows when we're getting one but uh on twitter at matt Ligori and uh, check out the free agents podcast where brian scally and i are talking through currently the challenge all stars four um has been a lot of fun and uh, sometimes we talk about some other shows as well you know sprinkling some bb can 12 when there's exciting things happening there so uh the free agents podcast i'm on twitter matt Ligori. did i already say that already yes so thanks again yeah Mike. Yeah, Matt, I know that All Stars 4 just started on Paramount+. Plus. Uh, what's the pitch you can give to people, whether they be like devoted Died in the Wool Challenge fans or haven't watched in a while? Is this season worth watching so far? 
beyond worth watching. I mean, uh, one criticism you'll see from people uh, in modern reality TV watching is that, you know, it's just not the same as it used to be. People are not, you know, uh, the shows are not produced the same, The you know, just the, the people that are playing are not playing the same. Uh, but when you bring back players from the era of television that got us into the format of these shows and into watching these shows and made these iconic moments throughout, you know, specifically the challenge history, bring them back for a show like this. It's a condensed version of uh, like 12 episodes or so um and you get some big names people you haven't seen in a while um the hype for the challenge all stars for has never been higher so uh anybody who's on the fence about watching it even if you don't think you know the people watch it anyway you know it's, it's been a lot of fun of course brian and ali doing some great coverage over here uh on our hgp as well so it's been fun all right kirsten you are an all-star of your own right when it comes to podcasting what do you have going on Yes. So every week, Sasha Joseph and I are talking about celebrity gossip, pop culture, trending topics, good vibes, vibes only on Mess Magnets, which is super fun. And I'm guesting on the Ready to be Romanced podcast. Uh, it's recording this week. I think it comes out next week. We're talking about uh, Emily Henry's novel Book Lovers, which is my favorite book. So uh, come check that out when it drops. And you can follow me everywhere at Kirsten Said What, including twitch.tv slash Kirsten Said What. And you can follow me at a Mike Bloom type, of course, talking about uh, some other big reality shows here on Rob has a podcast survivor aired episode several, which some are considering the best episode of the season had a lot of fun on the BNB this week with Liana as Beth Dixon, where I was proven to be an absolute loser when it comes to my survivor fandom. So feel free to check that out if you want to see nerdery at its finest or it's least fine, depending on your perspective. I also do Exit Press every week over on Parade.com with the most recently eliminated Survivor contestant. I do the same for The Amazing Race, which I talked about with the aforementioned Sasha Joseph this week with Jess, which was a very fun time talking about a messy as hell season of The Amazing Race. And something that I've been announcing that I will bring here as well, because it is Taryn Tangential. Uh, while you're sitting, waiting for those daily drops to come, The Circle is returning season six of the circle is coming on Wednesday. The first four episodes are going to air on Netflix. I can confirm we will have coverage of the circle and it is a doozy of a panel. It is myself. It is Taryn and it is Puya. The three of us every week are going to be coming in with a breakdown of the just dropped batch of episodes on Netflix. It's going to be a really fun one because for those of you that don't know, uh, one of the people playing is just an AI that sourced everything from chat GPT and is just providing that as their prompts. And so it is maybe the most like the biggest season with the most societal impact, perhaps to let us shine a mirror upon ourselves and see like how truly far we have either come or fallen in our acceleration to Skynet becoming a reality. But regardless, it's going to be a super fun time. So make sure you check it out on Netflix and check out our coverage with myself, Taryn and just, Puyas. Just like, like imagine like that person gets power and they're in those back-to-back -back rooms, like with the person that have to, they have to make a decision with and it's AI and a person. How is that happening? <laughs> I, I have seen a little bit so far and I can tell you it is pretty damn fun. Uh, I feel <laughs> bad for the people that we are going to mercilessly point and laugh at for the next month being like, I cannot believe you got duped by an AI, mm -hmm. but that's the entire reason for the season. And hopefully you'll check out our coverage there as well. Speaking of Taryn, don't you worry folks. He will be back. The sun will come up tomorrow from this movie night massacre and podcast night massacre. What I say? Um, oh, I movie... thought you killed him. What? He's coming back? No, uh, Taryn will return. He always does. He is much like a robot in and of himself. But our movie Mike Matza Kirsten is over, I think is what I called it. Bringing it back full circle. This was such a fun time. Thank you both so much thank you to everyone in the chat again this is a very different episode of bb can and a very different panel in and of itself so it felt so fitting but thank you so much for your support support throughout our live broadcast here and thereafter we'll be back in a couple days time with more bb can coverage until next time everybody take care bye-bye